Welcome, ladies, to Agent Exit Radio, the seasoned real estate agent's home for operations, personal finance, and retiring with passive income. You have entered a judgment-free zone, so give yourself permission to shake off all the things you haven't done, because your journey to having a real estate business and a life you love starts right now. Okay, ladies, welcome to today's show. Today, we have a great guest with us who's going to talk all about estate planning. Her name is Ariel G. Siner. She is an attorney for the Estates and Trust Group at Hogue Fenton in California. She drafts complex estate plans and trust works with clients to achieve their charitable business succession and wealth management goals. So she's doing a lot. She also works extensively on litigation matters dealing in and out of court with trust and estate related disputes. So why are we having her on today? We are talking to Ariel about your estate planning and the most important things that you need to have for your estate. Um, As we own these businesses and we consider transitioning, there are so many important documents that we need to have in place that are super important for our family, for ourselves, for those who are going to succeed us in case um, eventually if we pass um, or heaven forbid we have an accident of some sort and we are incapacitated. All of those things need to be considered and I know it's really, really hard to talk about but we have to have the conversation, even if we don't want to, we need to. And as business owners and professionals, we have to think about that first um, before we think about the emotion of doing it. So let's take off our emotional hats for just a minute. And we're gonna put on our business hats and we are going to get down to business with Ariel G. Siner to talk about estate planning right now. Have you ever given any thought to what might happen to your business? Um, Should you no longer be able to be, to lead your business or be the head of your business? What about your plan for after you exit? Um, What's the plan for who's going to take over the business and what documents need to be in place in order for that to happen? Um, And finally, what happens when we die? Nobody wants to think about that, but inevitably we have a business that is going to be left to someone. Don't we want to have control over that now? If we do, then we probably need to get some estate planning in place as soon as possible for the future. We do it now, we use it in the future. And that's what we're talking about today. Okay, ladies, we have an awesome guest with us today. Ariel Siner is an attorney and estate planning expert with Hogue, Fenton, Jones, and Appel in San Jose, California. Thanks for coming on the show today, Ariel. It is my pleasure, Renee. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, so let me give a little bit of a backstory just so people know how I found you. Um, I've done several episodes now, and I always talk about how I hunt people down. So let's tell everybody how I hunted you down. Um, I started the journey looking for real realtor retirement resources for myself. Like, um, how am I going to retire? What does that look like? And that led me to the Center for fin- for Realtor Financial Wellness. So the Center for Realtor Financial Wellness is a part of my NAR benefit that I have. Um, and through them, they provide these wonderful webinars. Well, guess who was on the webinar in December, 2020? It was Ariel. And so when I saw you on there, the information that you were providing about estate planning, I felt was just kind of like an aha moment for me because there was so much rich information that I either didn't know or I hadn't thought about. And so I thought for our audience of real estate agents, real estate brokers, team leaders who are experienced Um, who've been in the business for a long time, and maybe even for some newbies who might be listening um, with us today. Um, I'd like for you to share a little bit about estate planning. But before we get into that, can you tell us about you? Um, And let's dive into your your company just a little bit. Sure. So um, I'm Ariel Siner, and I've been an attorney going on five years now. Um, I grew up in California and I grew up around lawyers. My dad's a lawyer and my grandfather was a lawyer as well. 
Um, it was never my plan to be a lawyer. It was always, you know, oh, Ariel, don't do that. Don't do what I do just because I do it. Find something new to do. Well, in my world, you know, my dad and I are very close. And so I grew up really asking him a lot of questions and being very curious about what his job was and the way that he's able to help people. And he actually does some estate planning as well, among many other things. And once I was in law school, I got really interested in this idea of being able to help people in a very personal way. Estate planning is extremely personal. Um, you know, it's very, it's sometimes a little awkward for me to ask clients like, hi, it's very nice to meet you for the first time. Does your family get along? What are your assets like? <laughs> So, but at the same time, it's, it's very different than a lot of my colleagues here at Hogue Fenton. We're a full service civil law firm. We do almost everything. We don't do criminal. We don't do immigration. We do everything else. Um, so what that means is I have uh, colleagues down the hallway who, you know, are busy, you know, suing another company and protecting, you know, IP and all this stuff. And it's very company based. And while it's obviously important, people's business is important to them. But what's I think more important is your family and how you're going to provide for them when you're unable to manage things yourself. So having that personal connection with my clients is really what I love and what I love to do. Um, state planning is also, you know, it very much not one size fits all. It's very personal and there's a lot of variety in what I do. So no two estate plans are the same because no two clients are the same. No two families are the same. So that's, uh, that's why I do what I do. Um, and I've been doing that as well as kind of the other side of estate planning, which is estate litigation. So when things go bad, when the plan doesn't work or the plan wasn't set up properly, you know, mom's passed away and now brother and sister are fighting saying that's not really Really what mom wanted. She wanted me to have this. You always got that. And so um, seeing the fighting really helps me on the planning side because I can see what can, what can go wrong. Um, but, you know, that's just another way of being able to help people because, you know, you're fighting with your uncle and that's a weird situation to be in. So please let me help. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I, I was weird word just came to my mind was beautiful. What you do is beautiful because it resolves issues. Um, Family is so near and dear to our hearts and so many topics are so hard to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that today, this conversation with you will be a catalyst for so many of our listeners to actually start having these conversations, even in small ways um, within their own business or within their own family. Um, yeah. So can you tell us what, would, what do we need? What basic plan or documents should every realtor have in place, whether they own the team or own the business, or even if it's their solo agents, what should they all, we all have in place um, as we approach, I'm, I'm 18 months from being 50. I keep talking about this 50, like it's some magical number. I'm super excited <laughs> about it. Um, but as we approach 50 or beyond, like what should real estate agents have in place? So a typical estate plan is four documents. Um, and, uh, it's going to differ somewhat from state to state. So I'm in California, so I practice California law and it is very California specific, but the four documents that I'm, that, you know, everybody should have are pretty across the board with some variation, in all 50 states. So the, we call it the centerpiece of the estate plan is called the revocable living trust. And it's, I call it the magic box because you put your assets in the magic box and it comes with an instruction manual and then you hand the box to the next person and there you go. Like that's, that's the plan. Everything important is in the trust. So the way it works is at least in California and it's mostly the same across the country. When a person passes away and their name is on title to something like their house or their bank accounts or anything, you need a court to change title for the beneficiary, for the heir, whoever's next gonna take that piece of property, you need the court to make that order. The way we get around, so that's a process called probate. In California, at least, it is an expensive and time-consuming process, more time-consuming than anything else, and the fees for it are statutory. So that means that you there's a percentage that goes to the attorneys and to the executor and whoever's taking care of things, regardless of what the property is, how easy it is to manage, there's a percentage that gets paid. And the other 
problem, at least in California, that we have is it's based on the gross estate. So if you have a house worth a million dollars, but you have a $900,000 mortgage on it, those fees are based on the million dollars, not on the equity of a hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, so we like to avoid probate. So the way the trust avoids probate is that's why I said it's the magic box. You transfer your assets to the trustee, who's the legal owner of the assets. And then when you are unable to manage things yourself, your successor trustee just takes it on. So there's a new person as trustee, but the office of trustee still owns those assets. So that's why I say you pass the box to the next person. So it avoids needing the court process, which is very helpful for most people. It also, because court proceedings are public record. So a trust administration is a lot more private and it takes care of things in a much easier way. The other benefit too is for larger estates and because the world is always changing, there's no way of really knowing what's a large estate. You can, it, a trust is the way you minimize estate taxes. So right now the estate tax exemption is $11.7 million per person, which means that not a whole lot of people, it's not gonna be a problem. But Congress is talking about lowering it to 3.5 million, which you know everything you own at your death could be easily over 3.5 million if you have real estate, if you have, you know, stocks, bonds, whatever. That's a pretty easy number to hit, especially if you own your own business. So um, a trust is where we can use various methods to minimize what that tax is going to be at death. So that's, that's the first really important one. The trust is the big centerpiece of everything. Um, the other ones are the wills, power of attorney, and advanced health care directive. So everybody's heard of a will and at very, very bare minimum, you need to have a will because if you don't, you have what's called intestacy where the law decides where your property goes. So if you pass, if you pass away and you have nothing, you know, let's say you have three children and maybe one has made some bad choices in their life is estranged. You don't want a third of your property going to that kid who hasn't spoken to you in 10 years. But if you don't have anything that says otherwise, everybody gets everything. So if you have any specific wishes for what you want to happen, you can put it in the will. If you have a trust, you put it in the trust. In California, at least, if you have minor children, you name your guardians for those children in your will. So that's a really important one of making sure that your kids are taken care of by the people that you want to take care of them if you're not able to raise them yourself. So these are a lot of like hard things to think about, but it's kind of the flip point of if you don't have it planned, it is what it is. And so that's, that's why it's really important. So the will also makes sure that everything that isn't in the trust at your death goes to the trust. So everything's distributed the same way. And then the power of attorney is a document that's used during your lifetime. If there's anything, any reason that you're unable to manage your affairs, especially as people get older, any issues with Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that, or even just physical like infirmities. It can be hard to, you know, balance your checkbook when you're 95, you know, things like that, really basic stuff like that. So a power of attorney allows a person to basically sign your name on your behalf. So if you're incapacitated, if you're unable to manage things, it lets, you know, your brother, your son, your daughter, your cousin, whoever you trust to take care of things, that's, it gives them all the powers under the law to be able to do that for you. And if you don't have one of those, it's, we go back to court and we have a court, a pr court supervised conservatorship, which as with a probate, it's tends to be costly and it's public and it's time consuming. So it just kind of saves everybody a lot of headache if you have the proper documents in place. And then the last of the four is the advanced healthcare directive. And that's essentially the power of attorney for your healthcare. So, you know, during the pandemic, it's been a really important topic of conversation. It is where you name your agent for healthcare. So if the hospital can't communicate with you, who do they get a consent from? Who do they have access to your medical records to have that information? And then things like end of life choices, like under what circumstances do you want someone to pull the plug? Do you want to be an organ donor? Do you want to be cremated or buried? These are all things that you can put in an advanced healthcare directive so that when the time comes, someone at least knows what you want. And so they're not having to like make that decision for you because that's a difficult position to put your loved ones in.
So that's, that's your estate plan. You have a trust, you have a will, a power of attorney and an advanced healthcare directive. So I have two questions. Yes. Um, the first question is about the trust and the will. Mm-hmm. If I have a will, do I still need to have the trust? Yes. Um, so the will still needs to be probated. So having a will allows you to determine who gets what, but to make that happen, you still have to go to court. So to avoid that court probate process, you need to have a trust. So the will, yeah. So the will is very important because it, um, it, not everything you would transfer to the trust at that time. So anything that's lingering out there in your name and not in the trust name, the will says, put it in the trust, because then again, you don't want things kind of hanging off in the ether and saying, Oh, what do we do with this one account that mom forgot about from 30 years ago? Like, so it's a, uh, it's an important one. Yeah. I also like the trust. Um, my husband and I do have, um, have a trust. I, I also like it because if either of us is incapacitated because the will only kicks in if we die, Yep. if we don't die, but we're not able to make decisions, he can't, if he's incapacitated, he can't sign anything. Exactly. And so it's helpful to have that trust in place because now I can make decisions without him having to then sign everything because exactly. he, he can't, he's just physically mm-hmm. not able to. Mm-hmm. And, and unfortunately for us, we've had family members who have become incapacitated due to a car accident or a stroke or some other, you know, disabling type of event that nobody would have thought about this type of catastrophe. Yeah. Um, and, and yet the person still lived Um, And so they had a will, but it doesn't help to have a will if you're still, if you're still. Exactly. So you have, that's the trust works for that circumstance, as well as that durable power of attorney that allows, um, you know, your family to help take care of you. I had a client just recently um, come in that she, uh, both she and her husband were in the hospital for an extended period of time. Her husband has dementia and can no longer live at home. And she had surgery and she was just out of it for like three weeks. So her son was trying to take care of things, but they didn't have the only person that was named in her power of attorney was her husband who obviously couldn't manage things for her. So they had a lot of difficulty during that time. So as soon as she was able to, she gave me a call and had a new power of attorney drawn up so that her son could be able to take care of things when she wasn't able to. Okay. Um, And while we're on this same subject, Mm -hmm. do these things apply to my business? So I'm an entrepreneur. I own the business. I'm the sole owner of the business. Mm -hmm. Do I need to have these same documents in place for my business or does the personal personal document cover the business entity as well? It depends on how the business is held. So if it's, if it's a sole proprietorship, the durable power of attorney will work for that. Um, if you're the manager of an LLC, then, um, if the LLC is, uh, well, it may work for that. It depends, I think on the state, um, on whether or not that will work, but, um, typically, uh, an entity interest, like a corporation, an LLC or a partnership, the ownership interest would be transferred to your trust. And so it would be a trust asset. So most of the time in that circumstance, the trustee then can make those decisions, um, for the business. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So what if I'm not wealthy? I'm not rich. Um, I'm an agent. I have a small team. That's just me and a couple of administrators. Um, I'm making, you know, six figures a year. So let's, let's assume I'm making net $150,000 a year. This sounds like it's for rich people. Is it, is this for me? Yes. So it's the more complicated tax planning stuff is definitely for people in the seven, eight, nine figures and above. But as I, you know, the, the whole thing of, do you want your family to have to go to court when you pass away? Do you want to make sure that, you know, oh, I have this certain asset or my business or something like that, that maybe my daughter has been helping me with for years. And I want it specifically to go to her. If you have specific wishes at all about anything, you're going to need an estate plan because otherwise the law will say what happens to what, and you don't have any control over it. So one of the benefits of it's called the American system. It is very, very different in almost every other country. 
that in the United States, 100% of what you own, you can decide where it goes. You can say that it all goes to one child and not to any of the others. You can say that 100% it's going to go to, you know, the SPCA and help the animals. That is your 100% right to do. And, you know, there may be fighting about it, but it is your right to do. And so if you have any preferences at all, then estate plan is how you make that happen. Gotcha. Okay. And earlier, I, I just remembered my second, my second question from earlier. I said I had two questions. One was about the will versus the living trust. And then my second question was video. Um, can I videotape any of these and have them be legally binding? Like in a room, let's say we're at Thanksgiving and we're all at the table and we pull out a video can a phone and say, hey, I want to talk about what I want to do with my business. Is that legally binding? binding if it's just a conversation? No. Um, so it can be very helpful in terms of intent. So a lot of these documents, the law moves very slowly, unfortunately. So a lot of these things do have to be written a lot. I think, I'm not sure if it's in all states, but at least still in California, everything has to be wet signed. So you can't docu-sign your will. So things like that. <laughs> okay. So things like that, everything has to be in writing and done properly, but there's a lot of things that can kind of be open to interpretation or, um, you know, for example, you know, for your business, if you say, I want it to go to this person to continue running it, or I want everything sold and just have it go to so forth. Some of those details are things that could be open to interpretation, something like a video, something, just a conversation at Thanksgiving with your family. I always think it's better to communicate and have everybody kind of understand what the plan is because that's how you reduce the fighting later on. Mm -hmm. Almost without exception, the cases I see in litigation where brothers and sisters are fighting is because one of them was kind of not in mom's life, didn't know what was going on. You know, the son who was taking care of mom knew this is what mom wants, but mom never told his <laughs> sister. And so that's what the fighting ends up happening. If everybody knows what you want, that's, you know, then everybody has the time to kind of accept it and keep, um, keep the peace, which is good. So even though it's not legally binding, having those conversations or having record of that somewhere is not going to be a bad idea. Okay. Gotcha. That is so helpful. So is it, is it important to plan for different family scenario, like for different scenarios? How does, how does that work? Yeah, so one of the um, one of the biggest uh, things that we're seeing increasingly is blended families. So you know, second marriage. You know, you have your kids. Your husband has his kids. Maybe you have joint kids. Maybe you don't. Um, there are ways to structure a trust. Um, typically, a married couple would have a joint trust together. In California, we have community property, so everything earned during the marriage is owned equally by both spouses. It's not like that in every state. But um, in community property states, especially where everybody owns everything together. But if you come into the marriage later in life, maybe you may have pretty significant assets that you had before that that are your separate property. And so there are ways we can structure the trust so that at the first death, we have what I like to call a his hers split. <laughs> so the deceased spouse's property goes into an irrevocable trust which means that those assets are available for the surviving spouse. So, you know, if you need help covering costs of medical bills or paying your mortgage, it's not like in a lockbox, but the surviving spouse can't change what happens to it. So that ensures that, you know, if let's say husband passes away first and he has three kids from a prior marriage, his property is going to benefit his three kids and his surviving spouse can then use her property to do whatever she wants and benefit her two kids. So it ensures that, you know, like evil stepmom can't take everything away. So that's, that's one of the most important things with kind of different family scenarios is, you know, you have the flexibility to whatever exactly what you want to happen, we can make happen for you as, as detailed and as specific as you want. I did a trust um, for someone who their son unfortunately has a drug problem and they don't want to just cut him out. They want to be able to help him, but he can't be trusted inheriting $2 million. So we set up an ongoing trust for him so that a trustee is going to manage that money, pay his rent for him, not just hand him a check and hope that he pays his rent. So to be able to use that money to, to care for him, to make sure that he lives as good of a life as possible without, you know, giving him too much control that would be detrimental to him. So taking those specific 
circumstances um, that are so unique to every family situation, the plan can cover that. And does it, can you also cover, again, I also, I always take it back to owning a real estate business because mm -hmm. that's the crux of who we're talking to. Yep. So, so this can be put in place for your business as well. You can put mm -hmm. um, these plans in place for the business, for family members, for succession planning, for people who are already maybe working in the business. If you want someone to succeed you within the business, can you put all of those things in writing and is it separate from your personal it's, it's going to be intertwined. A lot of the things with the business, you may have a buy sell agreement or something in the operating agreement of an LLC that's going to cover some of that business succession. But typically the ownership interest in that business is going to be part of your estate plan. So whatever you do on the business side is going to be very closely connected to the personal side, because as we know, you know, a lot of people own their own businesses, manage it themselves. So that line between personal and business can be very blurred. So the same thing with the legal side of things, planning the succession of your business is gonna be very closely tied to planning for the succession of your personal assets as well. And the other thing to think of too is, you know, my job is a lot of looking in the crystal ball and thinking what if, and planning for the worst and hoping for the best. You know, you could have all of the buy-sell agreements in place that you want to in 10 years time, have someone take over your business, but God forbid, what if you get hit by a bus tomorrow? You know, and that, that time that you were anticipating having to train your successor and things like that evaporates. So that's where the estate plan definitely comes in as kind of a backstop to what would be done kind of on that corporate side. Gotcha. Okay, so we may have already discussed this, but, but help me in my thinking about the consequences of not planning. Like a lot sure. of people are like, Oh, you know, Ariel, this all sounds great, but I haven't put any of this stuff in place. Like, you know, what, what would be the consequences for me for, for not planning? Sure. So I can kind of take you through kind of a hypothetical of like, here's what life looks like if you have no estate plan in place. So let's say you, God forbid, get in a car accident and you go to the hospital and, you know, who is your next of kin? Are you an organ donor? Do you want to be kept on life support? your, let's say, you know, your sister is, you know, the person that they call and she doesn't know. And so she's doing her best to kind of guess what it is you want. Um, but then maybe, you know, you're in the hospital for three weeks and your bills need to be paid. Um, you know, your accounts are being frozen because things aren't being taken care of. Your business is suffering because people don't know what they're supposed to be doing. No one has access to your bank accounts. So they go to court and get a temporary conservatorship, you know, on an emergency basis. So you have to go through the fees, paying for court filings and getting a conservator and someone who's going to be interviewed by the court to take care of all those things to make sure that everything's on the up and up and there's no fraud involved. And so, you know, all of that, you know, then, okay, the dust settles, the bills are being paid, things are being taken care of, but, you know, maybe you don't survive. And then you pass away and what happens to all of your stuff? The law is going to tell you what happens. If you have community property, that goes to your spouse. If you have separate property, depending on how many kids you have, it may go somewhat to your spouse, some to your children. It's going to go in equal shares to your children. You know, where's your son? Who knows? The court's going to have to find him. It's going to take six to nine months to go through that court process before anybody gets a dime. And that's after the court gets paid, after the court appointed administrator gets paid. And then finally, you know, then everything's kind of wrapped up. But is that what you wanted? Probably not. <laughs> and it was a big hassle for your whole family. Yeah. So let's let's bring it back to sunny days because it can get pretty dark <laughs> if we don't have these things in place. Exactly. But yeah. thankfully, we are completely able and capable of doing all of this yes. um, <laughs> now or within, you know, the next few weeks or so. Mm -hmm. So it, can you tell us about like a general range of fees or the time involved to set up the basics? Like what would we be looking at if we want to do this within the next 30 days? Sure. So it, there are lawyers all across the country who do things like this completely. And 
there's everything from, you know, a small solo boutique type firm that it's just a solo practitioner, one lawyer and their office staff, and all they do is estate planning. Um, depending on where you are, fees are really going to range. Some lawyers will do things on just a flat fee, like an estate plan costs $1,500 is kind of typical for what I see in like solo, very simple um, plans. Uh, you can also get more kind of customized personal assistance from a higher end law firm. Typically that's going to be on an hourly rate, anywhere from 300 plus dollars an hour. Um, and then there's always the option of like no low press or legal zoom as a lawyer. I have to say, I do not recommend it because as I've said, these things are not one size fits all. And those documents are created to be one size fits all. So it's not always going to work, but those are a couple hundred bucks. You know, if, you know, money's really tight, you want something is better than nothing. And that's the truth. Something is better than nothing. But if you're going to do it, you should probably do it right. <laughs> and if you want to take the time and energy to do it and have proper legal advice and someone who's really going to help take care of you and your family through the process. And so, um, you know, in California, in the Bay Area, we do tend to run more expensive than a lot of other places. But very simple, basic estate plan from start to finish we can get it out the door for you for about $3,000. Um, it's, if you have more complexities, more detail, it's going to be more. Um, but you know, it's, that's kind of the, the range that I see typically. Gotcha. Okay. And I do want to say just for those who are, um, mem who have member benefits, um, of the realtor community, that we also have some benefits that I will put in the, um, in the show notes, like a link to some benefits that we can get. Ariel, can we also put your contact information if you want to share that with us? Yeah, please do. I'm happy to answer questions through emails. I'm taking new clients. If you like me and you want to talk to me more about your situation, um, one of the one of the very few benefits of the pandemic is, you know, we do a lot of things over Zoom now. And for the most part, I've had I've worked with clients all through the state of California. So if you're in Orange County and you want to give me a call, I'm here. Um, but uh, yeah, the Bay Area, if you want to come into our pretty new offices, we're now open. So, <laughs> but yeah, I'm more than happy to, uh, to talk more about specifics with people. Awesome. This has been just the best conversation and it has flown by. We're already <laughs> done with our time. I don't have any more questions um, that I can think of at this point, but we would love to have you come back at some point in the future just to kind of drill down, like maybe into a little bit more detail on some of these um, specific documents. That would be great if you were available. Yeah, definitely. I will say the, uh, the tax planning aspect of things is very important, very difficult to get into with a kind of big overview like this, but um, an important one for people to consider as well. Oh, would love to. Would love to have you back to talk about it. So thank you so much for your time, Ariel. My pleasure. Thank you. If this episode has you thinking about getting a grip on your business operations and planning your exit strategy, then take some action. Go to our website today to schedule a strategy session at realbee.com. Thanks for listening to Agent Exit Radio. Be sure and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen so you never miss an episode. Join us again next week for more actionable strategies and resources that empower you to get out of overwhelm and into a business and life you love. All Agent Exit Radio content is for informational and general purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Guest appearances on Agent Exit Radio does not necessarily constitute an endorsement by the podcast. There are risks associated with investing, including the loss of your principal investment. Always conduct your own due diligence and consult your tax, legal, and financial advisors regarding your particular situation before investing with any person or firm.